Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist Lee Weeks. Lee, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Lee, you are known as, um, I, I guess, one of the, the masters of comic art. That's how they refer to you at Heroes Con every year, and I don't disagree. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your philosophy for storytelling, which is um, actually so expressive, so much fun to look at. And I'm wondering what's going through your head as you get that script and you start to put uh, pencil on page. I'm not sure that I've ever been one to have a, a, a really specific method, although I, I must have. But um, it was drilled into me very early on in my year at the Kubert School that uh, storytelling and clarity is first. So to me, it's it, when I get a script, I've received a puzzle. And my job is to figure out the puzzle and, and to make it work in a visual the sequence in the, in the best way possible that would give the reader as few hitches as possible. So it really comes down to clarity first. And once I've established the clarity of a scene and of the story, then to push and pull things in a way to, to evoke more emotion. So you want people to think, and you want people to feel. I've been looking at your Batman work recently, and, and the one thing I notice in that is that you are taking some real risks with storytelling um, sometimes it's very cinematic, sometimes it's very, uh, I guess, intimate and, and more personal. So when you're solving that puzzle, how do you get the sense of like this scene should be uh, big explosive action and this scene should be more of that moment when the character is realizing something? Generally, the script really dictates that to me. And as far as uh, you said taking a risk, I, I don't even know that I'd be aware of it as a risk at the time that I'm doing it. I'm just trying to find the best moment, um, and and I do. Uh, uh, I was thinking of this just this morning. I do enjoy very much finding the intimate places. And sometimes that, you when know, I say intimacy I, in storytelling, it may be close on a finger and a thumb. It's turning a key and an admission. You know, places where you can zoom in on the tiniest of detail and not break the flow of storytelling. Again. I like those moments because it just. It, 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 to me, it evokes uh, um, a little bit of the childhood wonder of things that you're so fascinated with details and and uh, and such. So, um, in terms of the big explosive moments, again, it just it just comes down to what the script is calling for. But what I do like to do is sometimes the obvious, um, what seems obvious initially in a script, I may sometimes try to. How can I turn this upside down? And, and those have provided some of my favorite storytelling moments where you find, I, I know it's something that wasn't, or I'm pretty sure, most times it's not something that the writer intended, but a way to just see it from a different uh, vantage point. And, and sometimes it really is turning the sock inside out. Well, it, it's interesting because um, you, you talk about looking at something one way and then and reworking it. And I was I had the, uh, the the privilege of watching you at Heroes Con. Uh, you were working on a, a Catwoman piece, and you had a, a small piece of paper that you were working on some ideas of, of what this picture should look like. And I was just amazed because you were working at something and it looked great, but then it just wasn't something that you were satisfied with, and you wanted to push it and put it another way. And so you had two or three variations of that Catwoman piece. And I'm just wondering, is this something that you're doing when you're working on a thumbnail or a layout of a page where you're, you're kind of saying, well, this works, but it could be better? Very much so. Uh, that, that, that's exactly right. And probably uh, one of the things that, that uh, slows me down the, the most. There's, I enjoy that part of it so much, finding the life in the drawing. And so sometimes, yeah, the, the figures uh, expressiveness of figures and characters that can work on the first pass and the second pass, but sometimes there's that extra, it, it usually is a natural nuance that I'm looking for, a turn of the head or just a, some subtlety in, in the uh, uh, gesture or the expression that I think will set it apart. And I, I obviously I can't afford to do that all the time. And sometimes I do think I, I do it too much, but it is a part of the process that I enjoy very much just so that it doesn't, because you, we can make a living doing this by having you know, three or four stock expressions and just, okay, I'll pull this one out, I'll pull that one out. And I, I mean, it's certainly uh, helpful to have a library of those uh, available, 
but it's also nice to just find an extra, a special turn for each, you know, especially doing commissions and stuff like that. I do, I do want to make them uh, special. <laughs> Now, you, you talked about the, the life of the drawing, and when you're working on a, a book that has, uh, you know, 20, 22 pages of uh, sequential art, um, I'm imagining it's difficult making every page perfect, but it's, it's also your responsibility to make it as close to uh, uh, that perfection as possible. So uh, I'm just wondering, when you're working on a, a deadline, at what point do you say, you know what, I'm going to have to be happy with this, or are you just saying, you know what, I'm just going to maybe skip sleeping a little bit uh, tonight so I can get it, so I'm really happy with it? It's been the biggest challenge of my career, very frankly, and one of the reasons why that you won't see a long run of mine on, on much of anything, um, but because there is that constant wrestling match between being a commercial artist and wanting to find something uh, unique, unique in each piece. Um, the thing that happens with storytelling in, in working from a script is at a certain point uh, in doing the, in the breakdown process, which is, I mean, they're all, they're all the stages are so much fun, but there's a unique uh, pleasure in taking the script and finding those shots, finding the shots. I was listening to Alfred Hitchcock interview just a, a week or two ago, and he talked about, to him, Filming the movie was actually, you wish he didn't have to do it. That all the creative work had been done up to that point, and then doing it was just something he had to do to, because he had solved all the puzzles, he had worked out all the problems. And I went, bingo, that's right. It's like the chat, the drawing is a necessity. And, and there's, I, I don't dislike the drawing. I, I love the drawing very much. But I just related to the part where he said the problem solving is done. If you've done your job right at the point of the thumbnails, and what happens is I, there's a place a, a few pages in if I if if I have the stamina to do a, a number of pages a big portion of a book a single issue in a day there's a place where it starts to become less drawing and more writing even though I'm making pictures but it feels more like writing feels than drawing that first one or two it it it's it, it can take a few to get there. But there was a, uh, a job I did a long time ago with Larry Hama. He was the first one that challenged me to, to try to lay out an entire book in a day. I didn't quite do it in a day, but I came really close. And that experience was, uh, and I should, now that I'm saying it, I should try again, because it was really valuable. And even when I look back on that job today, although the finish is not my favorite, in some ways by a long shot, but there's some real movement and flow and energy in that that came as a result of just pushing the envelope with with just getting through the, not getting through like hacking oil, but, but thinking about just the bare bones of storytelling, moving on to the next one and the next one. And it really does become like a writing process. It, it seems it's almost like um, uh, when a musician's on stage and uh, they kind of get into that moment where the song no longer becomes a series of notes that they know they have to play. It's just a song that's coming out of them. And it seems like if you're working on that, that uh, breakdown during one whole day to do an entire story, maybe you're hitting sort of that zen frame of mind where, where it's less about uh, thought and it's just more about doing. Very much so. And I'm going to bring up another example. You just, you just made me think of uh, one of my favorite musicians of all time is Pat Metheny, a jazz guitarist. And he... And I'm not a big jazz guy. It just happened that I stumbled upon him, and he has scored many of my jobs over the years. Um, I just I listen to him while I work, and it's very evocative of, of narrative, even though there are no words. But um, because in, in the first art school that I went to for one year, um, they, they, I had this one teacher who emphasized drawing is seeing, drawing is seeing. And if you talk to the students that I have now at the Cubert School, they'll they've probably gotten tired of me saying that because I'm, I'm so on board with that, that, that it's, it's more about the eyes. It's less about skill in the hand and dexterity, although that's certainly helpful, than it is about the eyes, the head and the heart, and just being able to see. And when drawing, and in those times when you've seen me at HeroesCon, I'm, I'm starting with an intention, but something happens in the midst of the process that 
that I see something that I didn't intend, and you kind of move to that. So you're, you're really responding <clears throat> very similar to the way a, a it's, it's like improv, similar to the way a jazz musician would, because I, I, I mentioned that thing, because in an interview he talked about, I'm just playing to the 12-year-old the in me that wants to hear the cool thing. So there's this micro, fast thing happening, this microprocessor where you're responding, in his case, to what he's hearing, so he's playing off of what he hears. And then uh, similarly with the drawing, where I'm finding that really natural groove where things are flowing, it's, it's responding to what I'm seeing more than, and, and that probably dovetails in with that whole writing process in the layout, that it, that it becomes responding to what you're seeing. Now you, you mentioned uh, drawing is seeing, and this is something that you've been using as, as a hashtag on some of your uh, pieces that you put on social media. <laughs> and it's funny because I wanted to ask you about this because um, you seem to be the type of person who you need to have something in your hand to be drawing. It, it seems like it's sort of a, you're compelled to do this from, from something internal. It's not just about making uh, you know, uh, money, which is nice, but it seems that this is something you'd be doing if you were working uh, at the bag factory down the street, you know, or, or if you were driving a cab, you'd be somewhere sketching something. So um, this, this philosophy of drawing is seeing, it's, it's interesting to hear that, you know, it, it's about, uh, I guess, what you see and how it inspires the hand. Is, is that uh, about what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that, that it's about being inspired by everything. But it's also, um, I, I don't want to go too big of an answer on this. There are rules to drawing. There are rules to music. There are rules to, you know, there are fundamentals that make, that help one along uh, to become proficient and good enough to do something professionally. I went to art school and I learned about uh, anatom anatomy, uh, anatomical proportions, uh, heroic figure is eight heads tall, so we have, a, we have these guidelines to help us. But at a certain point, those rules can only take you so far, and it's our observations of the way things work that can't really, and I don't think, I, I haven't learned anyway, how they're it, it, it expressed in rules. Um, the rules can, are there to help us for the parts that we can't see. But I, I, one of the things I, I find myself saying is if I could see perfectly, I wouldn't need any of those. If I could see it perfectly, I could just, it would be like Tracy. And if there's a, I always mess up his name, but there's a Korean artist who does a lot of work, shows a lot of his work on Twitter. And um, I think Instagram too, but he does these brilliantly long murals where he doesn't do any layout at all. He just starts from the finish. He sees it all. And it's pretty frightening. I'm glad there's only one of them on planet Earth right now because we'd all be out of a job. Kim Jung Ji, I think that's his name. I think that's his name. If I, missed that, if I messed it up, forgive me. You've worked on uh, a number of different characters, and yet you've always managed to make each character distinct. There's no set Lee Weeks figure that you work with. And I'm wondering when you're working on, let's say, the character design for a Daredevil uh, run, or you're working on, on Batman, or even when you're working on Bruce Wayne, what sort of thought goes into creating the character on a physical level and one that would also show what's internally happening with them? Well, it's nice of you to say that. I, I, that I, I, and I, I'm not sure that I thought of how different my characters are. Um, I know, especially in the early days, there's certainly strong senses of my influences in, in the, like when I did Daredevil, there's a lot of Mazza Kelly, a lot of uh, Frank and uh, some Gene Coleman. Just always, I, I always felt uh, a responsibility even to not be too disruptive to what, you know, had come before. And, and really I've always kind of had a sense that was in standing on the shoulders of giants that came before, and, and, and so, so I, I, continuity from what came before was always important to me back early on. Um, another thing that I noticed long ago in my work is there, even though there are these individual characters, there's a couple of 
general families of heroic character. There's the Cap and, and uh, you know, the, the clean-cut heroic type. And then you have your Nick Fury, Wolverine, uh, you know, the gruff uh, Gambit, a little and Daniel's somewhere in between because he could get that gruff beat up look and he's got the pathos and stuff. But at some point I noticed, I don't know if this is revealing too much, but the heroic ones with the, the square jawed and the. I often saw my older brother in them and the rougher five o'clock shadow ones, I saw my dad in them. Now, possibly that's both of them whatever it is that's been deposited in my DNA, that because that you, you learn to use mirrors and stuff like that for, for reference. So it's probably something in me that's that's coming through. But I would see, um, and my older brother certainly was my first hero growing up. So he, he, he my, one of my pals and I used to think, oh, he, he should have played Captain America in the, you know, back in the 70s when we, had good, we didn't have good depictions on screen of these guys. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's... I think you did, um, because it's coming from, from someplace inside. And, and what I find interesting, and I'm going to go back to that uh, recent Batman run that you did, um, there's a, a storyline where Bruce Wayne, and this should be just on the surface, this description is going to sound terribly boring. And if you haven't read this, uh, those of you who are watching, uh, I apologize. It's actually brilliant. Uh, Bruce Wayne is on jury duty, and he's trying to convince the jury that Batman is fallible. Um, and there are moments when we look at Bruce Wayne's figure, and he comes across as weak. And yet this is the same character who, when we see flashbacks, is this powerful figure of Batman. And I'm wondering, he's the same person, and we see him in other uh, scenes in other issues where, you know, clearly they're the same person, but the body language when he's out of that suit is completely different. I'm wondering how much of that is, is conscious and how much of that is just, you know, that feel? I, I think it's probably more feel, but it's not, I'm not totally unaware of it. And, uh, yeah, I'm not totally unaware of it, but, but I, a lot of it is feel and trying to capture, I, I, I if anyone looking at my career can see, I, I have an affection for characters with heavy doses of pathos. So, so where that and that dichotomy, that 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 uh, juxtaposition of the of the uh, more confident, maybe more confident in what he's doing when he's got the ears on. I, I honestly have never thought of it that way, but as you're asking the question, that's what I think it probably is. That maybe he allows himself more of that vulnerability and unsureness as Bruce that he can't afford to as, as Batman. How's that far off the cuff? Never thought of before answer. But it makes me think of that Superman scene when Christopher Reeve does the the change with a head turn. And the, you know the scene I'm talking about? Where you mm -hmm. see both personalities mm -hmm. in just this subtle acting that I, I think is probably underappreciated for how, how brilliant it was. One of the things that, uh, that I I'm struck about in this jury scene is that you have, I guess, uh, 11 other characters in the book who are just random people, and yet you've managed to find a personality for each and every one through the way that you draw them, whether it's uh, a unique facial expression or whether it's body language. And, and again, uh, I'm going to be the broken record. How are you coming up with this solution? Is this something where each of these characters is someone because you're thinking of somebody, or is it somebody because that serves the story, or is it just, you know, Again, it's that internal, and it just kind of comes out as it comes out. Part of it is in the script. Um, there's a, a little bit of a description in the script, but then certainly I went with it. And I think there's almost a, uh, a fear or an aversion. Or, 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 or I know I didn't want to get caught making two of the same, you know. And, and one reason. It would just, it could get confusing pretty quickly with all sitting around one table if you cut one to the other and they're too similar. That, uh, um, so we needed some, some clarity. There are a couple of them that were based on actual people. Um, I got outed on one of them. It was a little too close of a likeness. But some of them were just people that I know that, that no one else, you know, reading the books would know. 
it, it's funny because that job and even the previous job, it, it's interesting that you say, start out by saying people are going to think it's boring or I think I probably thought that too when I was drawing it, but if, you, if it's a good idea and you, and you play the tension right, I think Tom King does a brilliant job with those kind of settings, those kind of scenes. Um, and I love to try to explore the more subtle, where you don't need extreme action to, to uh, tell a story. Um, it, it really does hold together pretty well. He, he did a great job in this, you know, balancing out the, all that quiet stuff with some pretty good punctuated action scenes, I thought. It is a testimony to Tom King and his writing ability. And I'm surprised he didn't draw the book himself because I've seen some of his, uh, his uh, original uh, cover sketches online. And, and really, I don't know why he needs you at all. I tell him that every time. I think he just feels sorry for me. You know, <laughs> wants to make sure that I'm, I'm, I've got a roof over my head, I guess. So he lets me draw a few. Now, I wanted to just uh, go back to, um, uh, again, just talking about the Batman run because it's what I've been looking at lately. There's a, I guess it was the annual that you'd worked on where, uh, where Catwoman is, is coming by Bruce Wayne's, uh, I guess, Wayne Manor and um, leaving little, uh, you know, trying to get him to trap her and she's always successful getting away. Uh, and there's just a, a double page spread that to me is, I, I don't know why it's so brilliant, but it is. It's, uh, it's a rooftop scene where uh, it just seems like maybe two thirds of the, the entire page are shadows and, and, and maybe some skyline. And the figures themselves are, are very small on the page and yet that makes the scene so powerful. And I'm wondering, is this something that's in the script or is this something that you're looking at the script and interpreting it uh, the best way to tell that, that story, that distance between the two? Oh, it was definitely in the script, the two page spread with just the two little figures, but then it's finding where those two little figures, where, where that happens, where, where that emotion happens. Because it, it's a funny thing, but it, you know, you move. I, I, again, going back to subtleties, and, and I talk about this with the students, you just change a crop a little bit, you crop a little bit more, a little bit less of the forehead. You come in a little bit more from the left, a little bit, on a I'm talking about close-ups now. Just changes, and it doesn't just change that shot. It changes the page. Every change changes everything. So it's still, even though it's simple, it's not always easy to get there and to find just the right amount of, uh, and you know, playing around with just how much was going to be black and how much. Um, and certainly, I benefited. We all benefited greatly from Elizabeth Brightweiser's colors. She just she. She is the, the most perfect colorist, I, and I've worked with great ones. I've worked with a lot of great ones. In some ways, I'd say we're in the, the golden age of comic book coloring. There's so many talented colorists, but I feel an extra level of simpatico with Elizabeth, and she just really seems to know what to do with, uh, with what I've done. But yeah, that was a, that was a neat, fun, fun story and a, and a fun double page spread. But you think, oh man, I can do two little figures. I can, I can pay for two pages, and then a day and a half later, it's like I'm still trying to figure out how to where to place them. It's like, yeah, it probably didn't take me that long. But, but it, it, you can spend a lot of time moving things around just to get just the right pop. And it reminds me of, um, uh, I guess it would be a pinup that you did of. Uh, it's Batman and Catwoman's uh, heads, and it's, it's mostly just a black background, but there's just enough information to show you their two faces. They're looking at each other. Um, and we talked a little bit about that, how, um, how you worked on that. I was wondering if you could just tell us a, a little bit about how that idea came about and, and you know, how you were able to execute it. I think that's when I was working on the uh, uh, Cold Days story arc, the jury story arc. And they called and asked if I'd be willing to do a page for issue 50. And I decided that I can't believe they're asking me to do a page. I'm, I'm like right up against it with the deadline. I didn't say that out loud, just inside. I was, and, I, and what came out was, uh, just give me overnight. Give me overnight to see if I could think of something while I worked. I wanted to work to see if I could think of something. And as I was either working or I, I just backbrained it while I was working on what I was doing, I think, and, it, and this image popped into my head pretty close to what it came out like. I had an idea that 
Well, that's something I could do. It'd be simple. It'd be stark, striking, and uh, hopefully I could do it quickly. But it didn't end up being quick. It, it, that one really did end up being a, about a day and a half of tweaking and adjust. I mean, I had the drawing in no time, but then making the adjustments and and that idea of of uh, the forms disappearing into the black and reemerging and just I, I played around with uh, a lot of unconnected lines, just just the, the the space between the the lines to it creates like a little synapse, a little a little bit of attraction and dynamics. I, I played around with that a lot, and uh, it's one of my favorite drawings. Tom keeps trying to buy it from me, and, and, and I feel guilty that I. I won't sell it to <laughs> well, it, It's funny because I was, um, uh, this morning I brought in some pieces that I've, uh, some prints of yours that I brought in, uh, put one on the set behind it, and I was showing everyone that piece, and everyone was just like, wow. Uh, even non-comic fans were just the same sort of uh, taken uh, by that, that image because it's just so iconic, and uh, although it's simple, there's, there's so much complexity to it. But, um, what I'm noticing is they're telling me that we are out of time right now, Lee. So I wanted to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.